joining us for the 10th and final Women in Live Music weekly webinar. It's been a wild ride and a total blast. And um, yeah, thanks again just for everyone for making these possible uh, for all the participants and people who have been talking and sharing their knowledge. Um, for those who don't know who we are, Women in Live Music is a nonprofit organization that was founded at the start of 2018. Because women um, currently make up a really small percentage of the live music industry, between 5 and 10 percent, and we believe in diversity and that the music industry is a place for everyone. So we started this organization to um, grow a positive community, um, kind of have a place where people can connect, share their skills, opportunities and knowledge, and hopefully uh, equalize the gender balance in the years to come. Um, Despite being called Women in Live Music, we don't exclude anyone from joining uh, our events or these webinars, so everyone is welcome to join them. Um, please today type any questions you have in the chat as usual, and then we will go through them at the end. Um, I'm now going to introduce Ida, who is going to be talking to us uh, today all about rigging, and she has a wonderful presentation. So hello, Ida. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. No problem. Would you like to start this webinar just by giving us a little bit of a story about how you got to where you are today? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I started working as stagehand in Sweden, uh, where I'm from really. Um, and I just accidentally got put as a ground jigger once because they didn't have enough people. Um, and then I went to the UK and started working for um, Stage Miracles for a couple of years um, and when I was working for them I was doing like um, the follow spot trusses and I was climbing up the trusses and doing all of that um, and then I started to be a steel hand so I'll climb and build all the stages, a stage hand for that kind of, kind of thing and um, started talking to the riggers and they said well I mean if you could do that you, you might as well come and come and join us and try to to work work with us you know because it's really working at height both of them um, so I think my first job was Glastonbury um, 2011 maybe 2010 and that's kind of how I started. Wow that's quite a first job to go straight to Glastonbury yeah it was great it was it's still my favorite job um that i do every year um so i'm gutted that i missed, missed that this year so when you were starting out as a rigger because i guess i had this assumption that um people who work as riggers need all these certifications like all this health and safety stuff and stuff did you not have to do that when you first started no when i started there wasn't really any any certifications that you needed to have it's a little bit different today when you have to have your nrc and and you know other stuff uh, so today i guess apprenticeship and and, and that's the easiest way in. but when i started you, you got taken under someone's wing and they would teach you and then uh, you kind of learn that way you know because it's quite a hands-on job so so you learn best when you're doing it um yeah definitely um, so you mentioned Glastonbury. Are there any other uh, productions you've worked on that you want to mention? Um, well, I worked in a lot of productions, but it's because you're there like five or four in the morning and just put the motors up and leave. All of them are pretty much the same, you know. Um, so Glastonbury is the only one that's really, really special. Um, and I did the opening in the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. That was pretty cool as well. Um, but otherwise, it's it's kind of most most are the same really. Um, it's just Mark Marcus and Trust. It's a different day. Yeah. Do you have like a favourite venue you like to work in? Um, not really. The O2 is the easiest. Um, but I kind of I like to do theatre. That's that's my that's what I like to do. Bit, bit more tricky, a bit more, you have to think about it a bit more, you know, not just pulling points. Yeah. Okay, so um, you've got a presentation for us. Uh, would you be happy to start with that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so if I can share my screen. Cool, that works. All right. And can you see my arrow as well now? Yeah, we can. 
Ah, perfect. So um, this is a little introduction to rock and roll rigging. Um, there are so many different kind of branches with rigging that I can't really go through all of them. Um, but, but since rock and roll is the easiest and maybe what most people are interested in, this is just kind of a day um, how, how you would start a day in rock and roll rigging, Michelle. Um, so this is how the venue looks when the show's going on and this is kind of what you start with. Um, so rigging is the first department coming in and we're the people who um, to install the temporary lifting system that lifts up the whole uh, the whole show uh, with the sound and the light and, and the video and, and everything. Um, and that's mostly done by Marcus, as you can see on this picture here. Um, and there's, there's different, there's one ton motors, there's two ton motors and half ton motors. So it's different sizes of motors um, and that you, that you use to, to put up the show. And this is, this is an example of, of a rigging plot that gets sent in before the show to the venue. And the venue approves it, you know, this is all the weights and, and the motors if that's okay or not and then um, when everything's been okay and approved um you're ready to start the show um so the first part of the day you kind of see who's your head of department which is your agent d uh, he's your supervisor and he kind of decides uh who goes where and what does what and you always start with like with a little toolbox talk um what the show is how heavy it is how many points there are, if there's anything that's out of the ordinary, kind of what to look out for, if anyone's new and need a bit of help or, or you know, anything, um, anything particular. Um, and then, then you get your job allocation, which is a bit different every time. Um, either you can go up on the beams, if you work on the beams, or you can stay on the floor as a grounder, and I'll tell you a bit more what that is uh, later. Or sometimes you just work from the catwalk, uh, or if there's a machine, um, a cherry picker, some people would have to go out in the cherry picker. Um, and the first thing you start with in the day is the mark out. So that whole rigging plot that you saw, you transfer that to the floor, as you can see here, all these circles are marks for, for the markers. Um, and then you, you have to make bridles to, to hang the points. And I'll show you a bit more what the bridles are, uh, a few pictures down, but you need to calculate the bridles and you write them down on the floor as well. So when you see all of these weird little scribbles, I'll, I'll tell you what they mean as well, if you can the venue. Um, so these are signs for different motors. Um, certain productions, does it, a little differently sometimes when they do maybe squares of video and um, so I normally squares of sound and triangles of video and circles of light but this is my favorite way of doing it because you can you could just see from a mile when you're walking a square on the floor is a two-ton mile uh, so it's, I think that that's easier to see when they do it like that so um, I prefer to have it like that so when you when you do the mark up you start your day with a datum, which is like, that's your zero of the venue. And you have two tape measures lying on the floor. And the datum, it could be like the front of the stage, it could be the back of the stage, it could be the house datum, which is like the point of the venue, that's zero for everyone. And that's where you start with your tape measures from and lay them out. So for example, here are three points, and you know that this point is two meters up, and three meters to the side. So you have two people here putting their tape measure on two meter and one little person going here and marking this out on three meters. And you kind of do one side of the stage and mark everything out and then you flip over to the other side of the stage and mark everything out and then you kind of go and do everything uh, around here. Um, sometimes the production has, has a rolling stage and you, you just then they build the stage on the other side of the venue and you can, you can have the whole floor and just mark out, you can just do everything at once. And that's really nice and easy. Um, so with 
the bridles in the roof to get the points where they need to be. You have to make bridles, and this is how it looks in the roof. There's two things that goes around the beams. These two are called baskets, and then there are two legs here, and then there's an apex here, and that's how you hang the points. Um, so this is how a basket looks. It's got two shackles, because this one is really easy. You could just wrap it around, open it up here, and stick it in there. Um, and this is how it looks on a busy shell with a lot of bridles in the roof. Um, so what you might see here is that to get everything on the place that it needs to be, the legs have to be in a different length. So that's your bridal recipes, you know, that um, just all the points come at the right place. And every venue does it a little bit different. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's just pretty venue specific. And this is how it looks before the show's gone up. So to make these bridles um, longer or shorter, you have something that's called an adjustment, which is normally in rock and roll, something we call a stat chain, which is here. So for example, if the point's hanging down there and it needs to move a little bit to the right, you could just add two links and it will slide in where it needs to be. And that's kind of how, how you work. And that chain looks like this. So these links here, that's got weight on it, are called active links. And these links here that are not used, that's just hanging there, are called dead links. You can see here we've got three active links. And then the rest of the chain is just hanging there. That's the dead links. Um, yeah, and this is how the steel normally looks that we build the bridles um, from. Normally, um, the red to five foot, the white are 10 foot, and the blue are 20 foot, and the green are two foot, but that's not always the case. So it's always best to check before. Um, so you transfer your rigging plot to the floor and write it down in circles. And then you get your right bridal recipes down like this. And this is quite hard to, to see what it says, but you learn that quite quickly. Um, so if you pretend that this is the floor, this would mean that this is two legs, 20, 20 foot and 22 foot. This is a five foot basket, which is what we saw here. This is the basket with the two shackles. So that, that's the bit that goes around the beam. And this is three links. So this is the deck chain that we saw, this one. And so that means three active links. So this is where we got our adjustment if we need to, need to move and we can add or take away links in this side. And this is the apex where, where the center of the bridle is. And either the motor can go straight into there, or if the chain isn't long enough, you can have a little stinger, which is 20 foot, so that's just another steel hanging down. Um, yeah. So yeah, on this one, it's a 20 foot leg, 20 foot leg, and three active links, and a 15 foot basket, and a 10 foot basket and 15 foot steel hanging down. So the motor will be here on this one. Um, so then you start your day and you start to assemble all of these bridles on the floor and you um, place the motors by the points, whether it's their one ton motors or two ton motors. Uh, and when you start to build the bridles, a few of the riggers will go up to the roof and start to um, prepare their equipment and start to uncoil the ropes. So um, you normally have two riggers, um, one in each beam, pulling the bridles up 
one leg each, uh, and it looks like this. See these two guys sitting here, they're pulling a bridle, and then you put a pulley up on, um, on the beam here. And either someone helps you to pull from the catwalk, or you pull it yourself. Uh, and you can just step out on the beach from the catwalk like this. Um, and the ground rig is uh, are super important. They can make your day either really easy or really hard. Um, so they're the one who ties, ties the knots on when, when they're sending these bridles up. And if they tie your knot on, on the right place, it's really easy. You just have to wrap it around the beam and put it on, you know, um, but if, if they tie it on at the wrong place, it quite, things quite easily get jammed and, uh, and it can be quite hard to, to figure out. Um, so that's always really important to know where to tie or not, but the person upstairs will tell you. Um, and as the bridles goes up, as the ground, you check every single shackle and make sure that they're straight, nothing is side loaded, um, and that everything is tight and good. And then when they've pulled their point up and it's hanging, you have something called the little laser, which shoots the laser dot up to the roof to check that, that your motor's hanging on the right place. If it needs to move, either you tell them to slide their bridle on the beams, or you tell them to change their, their links for, um, for the legs, either adding or taking it away to kind of steer it in when it wants to be. Um, and, and if it's all good, you know, it tells them that they're ready to, to move to the next point. Um, and this is obviously your shackles that you make a bridle with, put all the steel together. And it's very important that you load it correctly. Um, so this is, this is a good chart for that. You know, you can never load from two different angles. You can only have one force down from the pin. But on the bow, you can have, you can have two. And if you struggle to kind of figure out um, how to build, well, how to load the shackles, this is an O-ring and that, that can help you quite a lot if, if you struggle to fit in steel. Um, And yeah, that, that will help you to get you more directions with your forces. This is this is a bit um, yeah, this this is something that that if, if you're interested in rigging, you need to be aware of this. Um, this is just a chart of bridal forces. So if you make your bridle too shallow like this you actually put more force on the legs than what the point weighs. So the 120 degrees is the most that you can have your bridle with. And when you do that, you have 100% of the weight in each leg. But as soon as you go more than that, you kind of quite quickly um, increase the weight. And that's obviously not good because... Um, yeah, you, you, can't, you can't overload your roof or your steel or anything. So always be aware of that you can't have your bridles too shallow, you know. And if you're not sure, uh, ask your supervisor and then they'll, you know, have a look at it and they can tell you. Um, and by this point, like the riggers, they'll move from point to point until, um, until the show is hanging. Um, if you've got nothing to do and if you're on the beams, you kind of normally look around in the roof to make sure that all the shackles are like right turn around, nothing is side loaded, everything looks good. And kind of when everything's hanging, um, you'll have one or two people walking around in the roof. Sometimes an engineer comes in and walk around in the roof just to make sure that they're happy with, with everything. And when, when that's all good, everyone can come, come out of um, the roof. Um, and at this point, a small team of people will be chosen to, um, to stay, uh, and, the, and the person that's in charge has to stay as well. Um, just, just to wait until the whole show is hanging in case you need to switch motor out or um, something breaks down. And when, when the tour rigger, the, the person from the tour that's in charge 
of it is happy that everything is hanging and it's not going to move, then everyone can go home. Um, and for the lard out, um, the riggers go straight up uh, and start dropping any points that are free, um, the steel and the motor, as fast as they can. Uh, the motors get landed in the boxes and packed in the truck. And then you separate all the steel, sort it out in the boxes, pack it away, close the boxes and send that. And when all of that is done, everybody can go home. Now hopefully that's just a couple of hours or so, but... Um, and then you wash your hands and go home. Uh, always wear gloves on the ground, that's really important um, because the motor oil isn't really healthy. Um, and a few important points, if you are climbing or if you're asked to do something, you always have to be clipped on. It is, it is the most important thing because that's, that's the you know, difference between a broken arm and being dead, you know, always, always, always be clipped on. And if you're, if you're not comfortable doing anything or if you're not sure, always ask someone because people are always super happy to help, you know. Um, and yeah, if, if you're not sure, always ask people and never guess because if, if you ask a question, it makes you look like you're really interested and like you pay attention and people really, really, really appreciate that. And also, if you start guessing stuff, you quite often get stuff wrong and that doesn't get noticed until it's at a point in the show when it's really hard to, to fix. So um, always ask questions. It's never any stupid questions and there's nothing like too many questions. Always ask questions and people will be super happy to help you and they'll be excited that you're asking them questions as well. Um, so... This is about climbing, and one important thing is again to always be clipped on and always make sure you feel safe and comfortable. And if you not feel safe and comfortable, make sure that you get yourself in a position that you do feel safe and comfortable before you continue. Um, and if you have, have to work with any tools or anything, you always have to have them on a lanyard because if you drop them, uh, you can really hurt someone if, if you don't have a lanyard. And um, sometimes when you're working at height, it's quite easy to get a little bit stressed because, oh yeah, I guess, I guess you're working at height and when you start getting stressed and you try to fix it while you're stressed, it's easy to get more stressed and more stressed. So if you find yourself getting a little bit stressed, just make sure that what you're doing is safe. Stop what you're doing and just take a couple of seconds take a couple of breaths and just think of what you're doing before you kind of get yourself in a head spin, you know, when, you, when you're super stressed. And if you are not sure of something, and if you're not sure that you could do something, um, there's always someone that can help you because on rock and roll shows, there's so many riggers around. There's always someone that can help you or maybe just sit and look at what you're doing or sit and talk you through what you're doing or help you. So always ask if someone can come and help you or, or you know um, show you um, and one thing for me because I'm not very tall uh, and uh, not super strong I'm not weak but this always everybody works in different ways and what's a good technique for someone that's very tall it might not be a good technique for me so it takes a little while, but you have to figure out the technique that works for you. So people are quite often quite happy to tell you how they do stuff. And, and that, that's good that you have, you have a base, but sometimes you just have to figure out how things work best for you. Like people that are a lot stronger than me, they could just lift stuff up straight away. Well, maybe I have to think about it a little more and use leverage and, and, and things like that. But that, that comes, um, that comes with experience uh, and that's something that that you just have to learn with time and um, just don't take everyone's word for exactly the right technique because because you find your own um this is just a super basic kit uh, for a rigger a rock and roll rigger sometimes you need more stuff but this is just the absolute basic it's a harness it's a helmet it's a ratchet pulley which um, makes it a bit easier to pull the points 
It's a lanyard that you can, when you climb around, just clip on. This thing here is an ASAP that if you climb up towers, you, there's normally a line hanging down like there, and the ASAP just rolls up the line, and if you fall, it'll catch you on the line. Um, a rope to pull your points. This is the work positioning lanyard. And you can see that he's wearing one there. So you can attach yourself by the belly button and just have your hands free and work. And this is a laser that the ground is used to just put on the floor and shoot a laser beam up in the roof so the riggers up top can see um, where the point needs to be. And the small difference of starting out um, between a man and a woman is very small, but it's, it's yeah, um, I think in, in general, the rigging industry is super positive towards women. Um, they're always really happy when someone is starting out and they're always trying to help. The only thing is that maybe as a guy, you get pushed a little bit more to do a little bit better, you know, like get out there and do that. You need to just get out there and just do it, just get out there. While as a woman, maybe when you walk into your room, you're already perceived as a little bit shorter and a little bit weaker, you know, and sometimes you have to work a little bit harder to kind of assert yourself. And what happens because of that sometimes is that you get spared from doing work that might be considered a little bit too heavy. It's not done in like ill intent or it's not meant um, anything bad, but... Um, but that, that happens sometimes, like, oh, she doesn't climb, or oh, she shouldn't have to do the heavier motors, all this and that, uh, which, is, which is nice when you don't have to do the, the heavy work, but really that kind of just hinders you from advancing and gaining skills. So if you do feel like you are getting treated, like she doesn't do that, or you don't have to do that, you should, should say that, actually, I should do that, and I can do that, you know, um, because because that, that, will, that will help you in the, in the long run, you know, to do all the boring and difficult stuff. Uh, I think the difference is that if you go to your supervisor and say that, I want to do that, I want to try this, and he says, I don't think that you're ready for this, I don't think that you're ready for climbing, then he's just concerned about your safety and you have to listen to that and respect that, you know. Um, but but if, if, yeah, you just have to speak to them and say that, I think that I could do that. And they'll go, okay, I'll give you a chance or, or, or you know, I don't think you're ready for this yet. And if they don't think you're ready for this yet, it's just because of your safety. Um, but you just have to, like, make sure to speak up a little bit louder, you know. I think I, think I could do that, it's fine, you know. Um, and, yeah, just don't let them set any limits for you before you set them for yourself, you know. Um, be honest with yourself, what you can do and what you can't do what's too heavy for you and what's not and um yeah just set your own limits and we're all good to go and i think that was it for me thank you sorry i need to unmute my mic before i talk thank you Ida, for yeah. sharing that wonderful presentation um I really like uh, what you said about, um, you know, being comfortable and, and learning, you know, how to say no when someone asks you to do something that you're not uh, sure about. Did it take yeah. you a while to get comfortable with that or was it just like straight away, you know, that's how it is? Oh, it took me a while. I mean, I think I was lucky because I started to, to climb on the, on the little rope ladders for the truss and I was so scared, like transferring from the rope ladder to the truss the first time. Uh, but that meant that starting climbing at rigging was a little bit easier because I've already gotten over that fear, you know, but I don't think that anyone starts out just being completely okay at height, you know, and it's just important to give yourself a little bit of time to, um, to be comfortable, you know. Yeah. Have you ever had a situation where you've seen or something has happened to you that's gone wrong because of someone saying no or not saying uh, no? Even? No, I mean I've seen I've seen people who um who who doesn't do this, who doesn't stop and go, okay, I'm a little bit a little bit stressed now, I have to just take a second. And what happens is that you you start getting in a little bit of a pickle, you know, and then it get worse and worse and worse. And then you're just in a situation that you don't really know how to get out of and you have to 
you have someone has to come and help you out, you know, and I've seen that happen a couple of times. And that's not because someone's not good at the job. It's just because they didn't give themselves the time and the headspace to just take a step back and look at what you're doing and why it's not working, you know. So I think that's easily happened. Yeah, I'm going to uh, open this up now. If anyone has any questions, um, please just type them in the chat. Um, what I want to know is um, kind of why did rigging appeal to you in the first place? Like why did you decide to do um, rigging as opposed to maybe another discipline within um, production? Um, actually, I... Sorry, I just got to look at my computer. It was just by accident. Um, because I like climbing, I thought that was that sounded like fun, and I started, and I just didn't stop. Because I think from the beginning, I really wanted to do sound. That was that was the coolest. I wanted to be a mic man, you know. Um, but then I just really enjoyed rigging, and I just just continued. Mm. One thing that um, I often get concerned about as a sound engineer myself is that sometimes we're expected to be able to rig speakers and and do things like uh, such that you, you know you know from doing after many years of experience. And we're expected to know how to do it and how to fly big stacks of PA, and, but we haven't had the training. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, there's always people around to ask. If you're not, if you're not sure, you know, just, just get the supervisor of the venue, like the rigging department, and they're always super happy to help, you know? Um, so, so, I mean, maybe you could ask your sound company to send you on some rigging courses, you know, that would probably be a good thing, or some companies hosting maybe a rigging course at their warehouse if they've got space. But if you're not sure, there's always someone around that can help you, you know, you just need to need to find them. So yeah. it's better better to, to be safe, you know. Yeah, I 100% agree. There's often things that I've had to do that I've not been comfortable with um, in yeah. terms of flying PA and stuff. And there's not mm. always been someone to ask as well. So um, I think, mm. yeah, it sh there should be a lot of um, more people saying, you know, stop, I don't know how to do this, or I need some help, or you know, maybe there's someone you need to call. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, so we've just got a question here. I don't know if you've seen it. Or yeah, I see it. <laughs> so Elisa's asking, do riggers usually work for a specific venue, private companies, or are there riggers that do whole tours? Uh, all of them. Uh, tour riggers who all they do is tours, um, there are full timers that all they do is, is work for one company and like me, I'm a freelancer. I do loads of venues uh, and loads of different um, jobs all around Europe uh, for different companies. Um, I don't think that there's that common that someone works for just one venue, but tour riggers and full timers definitely really common. Yeah, I think in some big venues, they often have a, a dedicated ring, I th rigger. I think the O2 has one, Wembley maybe. Um, yeah, but they, they work at other venues as well. Uh, so they, they're the same person that's there every time, you know, but, but when they're not there, they're somewhere else. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and Gaz asked, are the bridles calculated on the day or in advance? Uh, with the leg lengths, um, depends on the venue. Some venues does it in advance on CAD. Uh, venues like the O2, where it's pretty straightforward, uh, they have little little tape measures that will that will tell you. So that get calculated on the day. Um, yeah, so it depends on the venue. Okay, um, Tia is asking, are you involved in any discussions about e regulations in rigging? About e regulations. Yeah, I guess that's I'm not really sure. Specific, I mean, I, do you have any, I don't know how to say this. Um, oh, sorry, I, I can see see that here. Uh, no, I'm not involved in any discussions about any regulations, sorry. Is it like a, I don't know if you know this, is it like a, is everything regulated like worldwide? Yeah. So, um, things are always calculated in feet as opposed to meters and things like that. Or no, I think I think that that depends on on the person drawing it, you know, because um, because you always get the drawing sent in. You know, there are a lot of a lot of regulations uh, for lifting equipment and for inspections of equipment and stuff. Um, 
And you know, obviously the weights for every shower has to be sent in before and approved by engineers before the shower arrives to the venue. Um, okay. Um, Steve's asking, what makes the O2 easy? Um, <laughs> first of all. Um, I think it's such a, it's designed in such a way for big rock and roll shows that it's designed to be really easy and really fast and to get like this huge show in, in just a couple of hours. And because they always have a lot of people. So um, you put your pulley up, pull the point up really quickly um, and you just walk straight out on the beams. It's, it's, it's just designed to be really easy and, and it's, done, it's done pretty well. Um, and what's my preference? I like everything. I like, I like the jobs when you have to think a little bit more. And um, so I, I prefer like maybe museum jobs and theatre jobs where it's not just pulling points, you know. Um, okay. Um, yeah, these great questions coming in. Uh, oh, we just had another one. Do you have any internet content recommendations about how to learn more about calculating points? Hmm. I don't really. <laughs> I think yeah, there are a few apps called iBridal or something maybe, but I think just Google. Google, there's a lot of rigging pages online um, because I learn from other people. I've never really visited that many uh, written pages, but I know that there are a lot. Great. Um, that actually brings me on to another question, which was, are there any uh, pieces uh, of software or apps that you kind of swear by and you, you use every day on your job? No, I don't use any software apps. Uh, I just get the paper drawings and, and do, do what the drawings and the statement says. So normally all the calculations and that are done by engineers before. Um, so I don't have to. Okay, cool. I've seen some, like you just mentioned iBridal, for example, but I've seen yeah. some cool uh, apps where you've got like your phone and it can like measure angles and stuff for specific yeah. types of rigging. I think they're super cool. Um, Another question from me is, what is your favorite uh, or most useful piece of kit in your toolbox, do you think? Um, I don't know, I guess it's my harness because that's, that's what I have to use every day now. Um, yeah, besides from that, I don't know, I've got a pulley. <laughs> this is so nerdy, I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love my harness, it's great. Um, what else have I got to ask? So, um, do you have like a favorite job uh, you can recall and why? Um, well, again, I just like Glastonbury uh, because the team is so great, you know, uh, we have a lot of fun. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just a really great week and you get to spend a week with, with all your really good friends, you know, and. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's the people that makes it really. I, I love all the people that I work with. So it's always nice when you get to see your friends again. It's funny when people talk about Glastonbury um, because it really seems like Marmite. I know some people who are like, I hate Glastonbury. I never want to work there ever again. And then some yeah. people work there every year and it's like the best thing ever. So yeah, nice that you're on the, the positive side of Glastonbury. <laughs> um, so, uh, Elisa has asked another question, which is, as a freelancer, what part of the gear do you have to own for yourself? Um, all personal equipment, of course, but what about ropes? Yeah, you have to own everything. Ropes, I have a whole cupboard full of ropes, different lengths, uh, different thickness. Uh, you have to own quite a lot of equipment. Um, but that's something that you just accumulate through the years, you know, you kind of start with the little basic kit there that I showed in, um, and then you kind of just gather until you've got a car, whole little room like, like me at home. <laughs> what would be like if you were going to make like an initial purchase of like the most, you know, useful or most important piece of kit, what would you buy first if you were starting from scratch? What would I buy first? Um, pretty much everything that was in that picture um, would, would is, is an investment, you know, um, mm. but, but you have to, you have to have it. Um, so yeah, harness, helmet, helmet is the most important thing, you know, that's the number one. Because if you don't have a helmet, you can't get in the venue. Um, harness, helmet, 
rope, I guess, you have to have, and um, yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of kit actually, probably more than uh, most other um, job. Yeah, because you can't really borrow per personal personal protective equipment, you know. So um, uh, so you just have to own it. Mm. And is there like a point where the things like ropes and, and harnesses that after a certain amount of time they need to be replaced and you have to make sure that um, they're in good condition and they're, they're not, you know, they're still safe to use? Yeah, so you have to, you have to visually inspect it before you use it um, every time. And I think it is every five years you have to change. Double check me uh, on that. And you also need to keep, keep like a log every time you need to... Um, in, like inspection log, you know, and make sure that everything's um, always inspected. Yeah, that's. I think that's really important. Yeah, because yeah, that one time when you don't is going to be the time when something breaks. I suppose. Exactly. So that's that's you know you have to make sure that your equipment is up to date and um, and no no damages. So um, a quite specific question here is. How different is the helmet from sports gear, like alpinism, or I don't know what that word is. Spell <laughs> I assume climbing, climbing helmet. Yeah. Um, well, it's caving. Well, it's essentially the same, the same helmet. You know, um, a climbing helmet is what you need. Okay, so you you couldn't just turn up in one that you'd get on like a building site, like a little yellow lid. You'd have to have one with like a chin strap. With a chin. If you want to climb, you what you would want to have the chin strap yeah. on the floor. You don't you don't need the the chin strap. You shouldn't have your chin strapped on at the floor. Um, oh, why is that? I think it's because you can rip your rip your head. You know, it wants to fall off rather than rip your head with it. If if you get stuck in something or um, okay. something falls on you. That's interesting, actually, because funnily enough, in the O2, I did have a 32 amp cable fall on my head from the catwalk, and I was wearing um, oh, really? a helmet, and it actually flew off my head about 10 meters across the room. So yeah. there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It worked as it should. Yeah, that, was, that yeah. was a pretty sketchy situation where someone had tried to, one of the crew on the ground had tried to tie a bowline. It wasn't a rig, it was just local crew. Uh, on a piece of cable and it slipped as it was going up and landed on was that head. Was that a long time ago? Yeah. Yeah, I was there that day. Were you? Yeah, I was, yeah. How weird. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. That's insane. Yeah. I, I mean, are you sure that there wasn't a day? Yeah. Day? Okay, wow. Yeah, that was... no. <laughs> that was a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, it was a very long time ago. I think um, a lot of the helmets I see riggers wearing are like these Petzl ones. Is yeah. that a good brand to have? Yeah, I've got I've got a Petzl one. Um, I think all, all brands, all climbing brands, are good good brands for a helmet. Mm. Cool. Um, right. Yeah. Keep the questions coming. Some really good ones here. Um, I'm gonna ask. Um, this question, which is, if you were to like go back in time, let's say uh, five or 10 years, is there a piece of advice that you would give yourself now, like knowing all you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, don't take things so personally. Um, Cause I've had a few times when I get put in groups uh, that's, like in a position where where I get classed as a bit client friendly, you know, so I can work really hard, but then I get stuck on going around a golf buggy and putting up posters for the production manager just so the production manager can see that they've got a female, and that made me think that I wasn't good enough because I got put on the jobs that maybe someone that was really new uh, should have done really, and I took that really personally, and maybe I shouldn't so. Uh, maybe just don't take things so personally and um, if you don't think you're good enough you probably are you know that's okay. it good advice do you think it's been a problem um, obviously being a woman in you know and quite unusually it's quite unusual for women to to work as riggers I mean I've not met that many um, 
do you think that you get put in situations where you do get kind of like shown off in a sense or not not very often it, it just it's just happened a couple of times um but normally i feel like i'm really respected i feel like not a female rigger just a rigger you know and i'm, I'm you know I, I think that I'm, I'm respected and, and I get treated the way that I want to treat it. So that, that's just like a couple of incidents out of the normally, but, but on a normal day, you know, I think, I think everyone treats everyone really well. Great. And do you think that, um, like say someone uh, wanted to get into rigging and they, you know, they don't have any experience. Do you think maybe crewing, is a really good way to get into it or is there another way maybe through education that you would recommend? I think crewing is a really good way to start because that that teaches you like all of these little things and maybe that will help you to kind of choose what you want to do as well um because that gets you to do a little bit of lighting a little bit of sound not try a little bit out and I think also a really good way to start is to be an apprentice that that's kind of um the best way I think if, if you're sure that you really want to do rigging there's a lot of companies that does apprenticeships and, and you'll learn everything from that you know okay do you have any um that you can recommend i'm not really sure who does apprenticeships now because of the corona but i recommend just calling around to rigging companies and, and ask them um, okay there's, there's terms, a lot of them around in terms of uh courses that you can uh take to maybe get some you know, qualifications that you might need, maybe um, I, I, iPads and things like that. Do you think it's worth oh, yeah. having I think it's really worth to have an iPad. Yeah, iPad is a uh, driving license for scissor lifts and cherry pickers. Um, I think it's worth for everyone working in the industry to have one. Because um, then you can, you can just drive your own machine. You don't have to someone driving you around. Uh, and with rigging courses and stuff, I guess it's good to do a rigging course if you just want to know a little bit about rigging. But if, if, you, if you want to work with it, I think it's just best to go to apprenticeship straight away because um, the course doesn't teach you everything that you need to know. Um, it's, it's such a long kind of learning thing. So if, if you want to work with it, you should go for an apprenticeship. Um, and IPATH is just really good to have. Mm. It's some stuff. Is there any riggers um, you know of, or maybe you yourself do this, that offer shadowing opportunities for people? Or is it not really the right environment for that? Uh, I don't think that freelancers can do that much shadowing opportunities. I know that out to take some shadows uh, every now and then, but I'm not really sure what they do now. Um, and it's the same, I think, I think just phone around to companies and ask them about shadowing and and um, they'll be able to tell you if they do it or not. Great. How do but, you... but for freelancers, oh sorry, <laughs> freelancers no, can't no. really take, take on shadows that, that much because you have so much responsibility at work that you can't really um, look after someone else as much as you deserve to be looked after if you um, come there for free. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's a lot of um, stuff around insurance and stuff. Obviously, if you don't have insurance and you don't have uh, PPE yeah. and stuff that you actually you're not even allowed in venues um, yeah if you want to do those sorts of things but um, it's good that the O2 offer things like that uh, if they still yeah do. that's that's worth yeah. checking out um, I had a question and I've sort of forgotten oh yeah that was it um, how do you as a rigger go about finding your work is it mainly kind of word of mouth or is there specific production companies that give you a call um, I just work for a set of companies that just phones me and emails me. Um, when you're established, you don't really have to call other people. You're kind of up and running as you go. So you normally just have a set of companies that you work for and they'll just contact you with, with shifts and stuff. Right. And is there any kind of online forums, Facebook groups or things that you're part of that offer opportunities or, or knowledge and things like that? Um, not really. I'm, I'm a, I've got the, there's a group on Facebook, I think, called Freelance Job Opportunity Jobs, which I think you were on that one as well, but Freelance it doesn't really... Swap, I think. It's, yeah, that's it. But it's not really any rigging jobs on there. Um, so, no, not really. Not for me, at least. Okay. I think I saw one um, called Everything Stage Rigging. I don't know if that's a good one. 
um, okay. which seems to have quite a lot of members and they share a lot of learning material in that. Um, yeah. I might just put the link in the chat for anyone that's interested. Yeah. Um, I know that you're, you're not big on Facebook that much, but I'm everywhere. So <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Yeah. I'll just put it in the chat. Um, cause I think this is a good group for things like that. Okay. Um, so I'm like going to wrap this up because I think we've gone through everything, almost all the questions I had with, um, the question I like to ask everyone, uh, who does these webinars, which is, uh, predictably, how are you finding this whole COVID-19 situation? Do you have, um, a backup plan? Are you coping all right with what's going on? Yeah, for me, actually, I worked so much last year and I've worked too much. So for me, it's just been really nice to get to land a little bit and sleep every night and be at home. And uh, because I worked so much last year, I'm quite lucky because I've got money saved up. So I'm not too stressed about it. And for me, it's just quite nice. And um, I've started making these these little earrings that I'm going to sell online in case in case I can't work for a little while. <laughs> so that's my backup plan. It's like mini rigging, little chains and little, yeah, <laughs> little bits of metal that you put together. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for for doing this webinar and the presentation. It was really insightful. I learned a lot. Um, and yeah, just it was brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you so much. It's okay. Uh, yeah, sadly, this is the last webinar um, of these special Women in Live Music weekly webinars. Um, this will be posted on our website and our Facebook page um, tomorrow uh, in case you want to go back and check anything or look at any of the images that uh, Edith in her presentation. Um, we are going to be doing one on... Uh, mental health first aid in the future. So we'll announce that soon. But for now, um, it's goodbye from me. Um, and thanks again for making these possible and, and joining in and, and Ida, of course, for, for your presentation today. Okay, thank you so much.